we've talked about the United States a lot. We've talked about the United States Navy a lot. And we happen to have with us uh, Admiral Robert L. Thomas, Jr., Director of, the Navy, Director of the Navy Staff at the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, and who in his last assignment commanded the U.S. 7th Fleet. Um, he doesn't know this, and he knows he, where he graduated from college. He doesn't know that I am a golden bear as well. And uh, <laughs> so I just want to share, we, we, I, we find it be interesting to know exactly where in California you're from. Where, where are you from? It, Palo Alto, the enemy country. Yeah, yeah, well the farm. He went from the farm to the real campus uh, in Northern California. And uh, so we'll have to talk about this. In any case, it is my tremendous pleasure um, to quickly turn this over to Admiral Thomas. And uh, again, we are so pleased to have you. And you've been here long enough to know that we're entertaining not such a, uh, a, a simple place. And of course, the issues are not unimportant. Anyway, Admiral Thomas. Okay, thanks, Richard. Uh, could we bring up the uh, actual uh, display that Tabitha had up to start with? Um, you know, first of all, uh, thanks for the invitation. And I recognize that uh, uh, we are about 10 minutes from the wrap up. And uh, there's also a Nationals game on. So if anybody wants to just kind of hit the Metro, there's a couple of stops over to the Navy Yard over where I live and, and we'll see if the Nationals can beat the Braves again. Richard mentioned that uh, I'm a graduate of uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, back in the 70s, and there aren't very many U.S. Navy admirals uh, with that particular pedigree. Um, so I had to give up my Greenpeace mem uh, membership when I joined the Nuclear Navy. Uh, that said, um, you know, my assumption, as Richard pointed out, is that you asked me here not as the director of the Navy staff, which is truly a miserable job, but uh, to kind of put a lens on from seven months ago when I was the Seventh Fleet Commander. And um, before I do that, I just, I wanna congratulate NBR and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation on rolling out this web portal uh, for this Maritime Awareness Project. You know, had I had this tool available for my sailors prior to coming out to the region, uh, what a fantastic, uh, device for them to understand not just the political military landscape, but the fisheries landscape, the energy landscape, just the bathymetry involved, all of the different aspects of the maritime domain, uh, because I think that's very, very uh, important to mariners. Now, I will say that it does say interactive map up there. Uh, as a mariner, I would prefer to say interactive chart, but I get it. I'm going to just take a pass on that one. So I mentioned kind of why do I care about this? And the education of the public, I think, is crucial. The education of policymakers, but then secondly, this collaboration tool amongst all of you, many, many experts, uh, so that you can trade ideas and so that policymakers can kind of look over at the, you know, they can kind of look over the fence almost in a non-attribution mode uh, to glean out some of your expertise, uh, but also our allies, partners, and friends. And when I say allies, partners, and friends, I'll kind of tease that out a little bit from that Seventh Fleet lens. And then finally, um, a topic that's very, very important to me, I think this kind of tool is another avenue uh, for us to try to get um, closer in the U.S. to ratification of our signature on UNCLOS. It is unconscionable to me that we haven't gotten that done. And uh, I think everybody's very, very clear on the U.S. Navy's position and the U.S. government's position on where we should be. Uh, and it's frankly it's embarrassing that we don't have a seat at that table. So let me uh, briefly uh, provide you kind of a former operator's view. Uh, if you saw what I did over in the Pentagon now for the Chief of Naval Operations, it's, it's positively clerical. So uh, this was a past life and a much better life. 
as you look at this uh, chart, it does a nice job of describing the U.S. 7th Fleet's area of responsibility from the international date line to the India-Pakistan border, 36 maritime nations, U.S. 7th Fleet on any given day is about 20,000 sailors, 50 warships, 150 aircraft. Uh, it has gotten noticeably smaller since uh, its uh, high water mark, um, not just in World War II, but uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, that said, uh, when the U.S. Navy uh, decides on a new capability actually being forward deployed, it usually goes to the U.S. 7th Fleet first. When I was there as the uh, 7th Fleet commander, we had the first uh, all Super Hornet air wing on the USS George Washington, our forward deployed carrier. Now Ronald Reagan uh, out there uh, forward deployed to Japan. Um, the cruiser, somebody mentioned the, the uh, PRC's uh, Coast Guard cutters at 10,000 tons. That's actually the size of one of our cruisers, not one of our destroyers. You know, a destroyer would be dwarfed by these two uh, Coast Guard cutters. That said, um, you look at our uh, capabilities. P-8, we brought it out there first. Uh, it's gotten some media attention, obviously. Uh, we brought out littoral combat ship. Um, we have a rotational uh, effort there, uh, mostly uh, focused in uh, the Southeast Asian area. Eventually, we'll move uh, littoral combat ship up into Northeast Asia. Then you look at uh, MV-22 Osprey, uh, the third Marine Expeditionary Force. Uh, um, they're stationed in Okinawa, another 20,000, so Marines there. So if you look at the total fleet Marine force, the Navy Marine Corps team, about 40,000 people and some serious capability. Um, now, uh, why? Well, uh, in my view and the kind of approach I took as the 7th Fleet Commander, I tried to look at the region through a five-sided lens. And the five-sided lens was really our treaty allies. Japan, Korea, Australia, the Philippines, and Thailand. And I put them in that order for a reason. And I think a lot of you are nodding your heads going, okay, I think I understand the reason. Well, from the Seventh Fleet Commander's perspective, it is the number of engagements and exercises that we do with those maritime forces. Okay, so obviously Japan and the Kaijo Jietai, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, uh, a significant navy. Somebody mentioned, the, I think, the number two navy in the world, and there's an argument uh, for that. Uh, the Rock Navy, very, very capable, punches above its weight. Um, then Australia, although capacity limited, uh, you know, down to 12 frigates, uh, building uh, two LHDs and an air warfare destroyer, and, and uh, sometimes, despite my best efforts, I can't talk them out of building a submarine force again. Um, you know, to Ian Story's uh, thoughts, I thought he was on target completely. Um, Australia is probably our closest ally when it comes uh, to the ability of, of planning uh, at the high end. Uh, I think most of you know that every two years we run a major exercise uh, called Talisman Sabre, and 7th Fleet kind of migrates south to Australia, and this is 33,000 people and, you know, combined arms and, you know, amphibious landings in Australian resort areas and all kinds of interesting things going on. Um, but at any rate, um, so Australia has always punched above its, uh, above its weight. The Philippines, obviously capacity limited, and to Ian's uh, point again, there is uh, a military that needs to focus on maritime security, not war at sea. And, uh, and then finally, Thailand. Thailand has a very capable navy. It's regional. Uh, but it is appropriate uh, for their use in the Gulf of Thailand and then out into the Andaman Sea. Uh, but once again, to Ian's point, um, I tried when I was a task force commander out there as a one star to talk him out of that submarine. And I've continued to fail as the Seventh Fleet commander. P uh, patrol coastal corvettes and maritime patrol reconnaissance aircraft of whatever flavor 
is what these countries ought to be focusing on. Really read Coast Guard. And they can take a page out of Australia's book. The Royal Australian Navy has a dual set of authorities, both a military set of authorities, but then a, a set of authorities that look more like our US Coast Guard. And, and I think that that's probably the model uh, for countries uh, in this part of the world as far as maritime security. And that goes back to the issues that the panel uh, was driving towards. How do you get to um, you know, coherent fisheries management? Well, I would offer that Coast Guards and things that look like Coast Guards have much more utility than navies in that regard, the same in the energy sector. As Seventh Fleet, I looked at five areas of interest uh, daily. Uh, the first and foremost was uh, the Korean Peninsula. And obviously, because of the instability of the North Korean leader, um, that was uh, daily uh, kind of, uh, you know, you were, what card are we going to draw today that's going to draw our forces into the Korean theater of operations? Uh, secondly, East China Sea, and we've talked about some of the issues there, and then the South China Sea, and uh, more and more the eastern half of the Indian Ocean, and then finally Oceania. If you looked at um, my over two years as the Seventh Fleet Commander, and then previous to that, uh, two years as a task force commander out in Asia, uh, the majority of my time was spent in humanitarian assistance disaster response. And Oceania, that entire swath, given climate change, given um, a lot of the uh, extreme weather issues that we're going to see more and more and more of, you, you just can almost you know, set your watch by that typhoon or super typhoon that's going to roll through take out Vanuatu, and then it's going to end up in Eastern Samar, and we are going to be back into a humanitarian crisis. Okay, and that's, you know, that's just one example. Uh, you know, when I was out as a task force commander living in Yokosuka, Japan, the Great Eastern Earthquake, Tsunami, and Operation Tomodachi, uh, and the beautiful thing is I watched navies and coast guards uh, and marine forces what are the two things that everybody wants um, when you have one of those disasters? Two things. They want this, and they want it delivered in a helicopter because there's areas you can't get to people without it. So I brought Lieutenant Joe Baker here today, my aide de camp, who was a helicopter pilot uh, after Typhoon Yolanda, providing a lot of these to the Eastern Philippines. And um, yes, we can go do combat at sea. Uh, the US Navy, uh, I'm fully confident in our abilities uh, to conduct sea control. Uh, but this humanitarian assistance disaster response effort, uh, that can bring a lot of navies together in short order. Uh, you look at the time that I was out there, it wasn't just Typhoon Yolanda, it was MH370. It was the Air Asia recovery. Uh, a lot of different uh, weather issues uh, and supporting um, was every Navy, every Coast Guard that could get there, including the PLAN. So there's opportunities there. Um, you talked in the panel about the frustrations of a lot of these institutions to get together and then uh, put together a coherent policy for the region. And I think, interestingly enough, uh, we can leverage militaries, encourage them in the realm of maritime security uh, in the future. And one of those uh, possible constructs uh, are the exercises that go on now with ADMM+. Plus. It's a mine countermeasures exercise, or it's a humanitarian assistance disaster response exercise. It's a counter piracy effort. Yes, we still have piracy problems in the South China Sea. You know, a lot of people forget that. They kind of tracked off into the Gulf of Aden for years, and guess what? There's, uh, it's a different flavor, but there's a piracy problem. Transnational crime. These are all areas where navies and coast guards in the region uh, can agree to get together 
Uh, they do that on a regular basis. I think Indonesia is hosting a Komodo right now and uh, very, very successful. I remember attending the first version of that. Now it's up to maybe 34 participant nations. So uh, despite the frustrations, understandable, and the, the concerns of the panel of experts, this non-expert, this operator, is actually pretty optimistic when I look uh, Navy to Navy relationships. And I'll close with, with uh, a kind of one um, thing that kind of brings Ian Story's uh, uh, perspective kind of up to the front. So in my engagements with uh, my fleet commander uh, counterparts of the PLAN, the North Sea Fleet Commander, uh, Admiral Ewan, he and I, if you look at our biographies, they're almost exactly alike. We're the same age. We both, you know, spent our formative years in the nuclear submarine force. We were one-star task force commanders out in the Arabian Gulf at the same time together when I was CTF-54 and he had the counter-piracy task force, and so on and so on and so on. Um, the North Sea Fleet commander and I got together for three days. I think we spent about two of it at the Singtao Brewery in Qingdao. But that aside, that dialogue was very open. Um, you know, an ability to sit there and, and work on things like cues, uh, conduct for um, you know, unintended encounters at sea, uh, various exercises. And then, you know, a little bit different, my engagement with Admiral Shin, the South Sea Fleet Commander, because he's down there under pressure. You know, if you were going to pick one of those three fleet commanders to be in the PLAN, pick the North Sea Fleet Commander. That's a good gig, okay? The South Sea Fleet Commander, uh, a lot of pressure um, given this uh, motivation uh, by China to uh, change the, the dynamics in the area and their commitment uh, to the nine dash line. Uh, but again, very frank discussions with him uh, back in uh, 2015. And uh, so I think there are opportunities uh, military to military to uh, get some things done that, that perhaps have uh, frustrated us in other avenues. Uh, I think Admiral Harris, uh, Admiral Swift uh, have engaged heavily out there uh, over the years, and, and we might be able to leverage their relationships just as we can uh, our Chief of Naval Operations, John Richardson and, and John Greener before him and their relationships with uh, Admiral Wu, Wu Shangli. Okay, I'll leave it at that, and I think we're uh, probably about five minutes over, so if you want to ask a question, fine. I, I, I've got one question before we open to the floor. We'll just, and one question from the floor. What is the danger to Fiery Reef and these other um, new so called islands out there? What is the danger to them of weather? You know, that's a, I think, um, a, a great issue. Um, I look at uh, these artificial constructs, um, and the first thing I thought, and it's not just because I'm a Berkeley grad, uh, I thought about the environmental damage that was being done. Um, I am much less concerned about, quote, the military applications of these islands. Um, I'm very concerned about uh, the effects on the environment, and then as you um, and there are people in this room that know much more about it than I do, as you get into uh, more extreme weather, as isotherm lines continue uh, to move north, uh, what does that mean for not just those artificial constructs, but the Spratleys in general? Especially because the ecosystem, uh, as I think it was Tabitha laid out, is so delicate. Let's go here, Chris. Oh, thanks. Admiral, thanks so much. This is uh, the last one. Hey, didn't you ask a question for the last panel? I did. Uh, didn't, aren't you disqualified or something? Nope. <laughs> Us Berkeley guys, i got to ask two questions. Are you Berkeley too, Chris? Class of 66. In, uh, Class in, of 73. When I was in Navy RTC. 79. Actually, there you go. I actually got to meet Admiral Berkeley, Nimitz, sir. Uh, he was 11 feet tall, as I recall, uh, and it was the so. I want experience. everybody to know I had a ponytail and Birkenstocks on <laughs> when I interviewed with Hyman G. Rickover in 1978. <laughs> yeah. That was the key, obviously. Uh, 
I joined the Navy for four years. I've just spent the last 32 yeah. trying to get out. Good, good. Yeah, but so far so good, and thanks. I'm glad you're there. Um, the reason I ask that naive question is that otherwise it's anything that gets dicey is directly U.S.-China, nose to nose. And um, obviously that worries you. you. You talked about your experiences. Yeah, I, you know, and I don't, I don't or, see or it that way. Ah, okay. That's I, what I, I really don't. Yeah. I'm much more concerned about uh, the skirmishing between fishing fleets and coast guards, uh, you know, in places like South Laconia Shoal, Second right. Thomas Shoal, uh, you know, formerly Scarborough Reef, you know, when the, I just, I worry about those. And, you know, this notion that the PLAN and the U.S. 7th Fleet are going to go toe to toe right. anytime soon, I think is, is uh, just, mistaken. Right. I agree with that. My question is, is how do you avoid it if we're going to have increasing incidents? Uh, uh, do, because everybody seems to rely on us as ultimately their back, their backbone until they get their Coast Guards and have things built up, which is going to take quite a while. I, 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 sorry. I, you know, I, I think we will um, obviously meet our treaty obligations, but I think we have a very, very... Um, important role um, in, you know, kind of across the diplomatic, informational, military, and economic perspectives to be the de-escalator mm -hmm. for our allies, partners, and friends, not the escalator. It, in, in that final regard, not posing, uh, we just saw Mr. Putin amuse himself buzzing one of our destroyers, uh, simulated attacks, from your discussions with your Chinese counterparts. And after the Hainan Island example uh, and lesson from 2001, are you less worried about that now with the Chinese playing that kind of silly game? Or, well, or I'm certainly or less worried about that with respect to the PLAN mm -hmm. and the PLAF, the uh, People's Liberation Army Air Force. Uh, their conduct has gotten a lot better over the last couple of years. Uh, we've invited them again to the rim of the Pacific exercise. So, um, you know, we conduct exercises where the uh, PLAN participates. Um, they are growing in their professionalism. One of the things they were very interested in when I was sitting there spending time with Admiral Ewan was how we built a very professional NCO Corps, a non-commissioned officer corps, our petty officers. The Chinese are trying to get themselves out of the conscription mentality and move to a very professional, uh, I'll call it senior enlisted corps. They figured out that's how we run our Navy. And um, so uh, I'm actually encouraged in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Super. OK. Super job. We are not going to spend 15 minutes, I don't think, wrapping up. Uh, you have been wonderful. This has been a long launch. And, uh, but what a spectacular conversation. I know those outside who are enjoying the good weather may have had a great time, got sunburns or whatever, but, uh, but we are enlightened. So what I'd like to do, uh, can I ask the whole team, Carlos, uh, Jeff, everybody who's been involved, Tiffany, um, everyone involved on, both, on the Sasakawa and NBR sides to come on down here. I want to recognize you, and I really want to first turn this over. and. and, and Taylor, you can talk to them all. I don't have anything else to say except congratulations. And uh, thank you all for coming. But uh, Taylor, why don't you take over and come on down. Come on up. Everybody up. Um, so, I mean, on, on behalf of everyone who's been involved in this uh, project, where's Sheldon? including where's Sheldon? Yeah, Sheldon. Come on. Um, <laughs> Thank you uh, very much for coming out today. Uh, a few quick items uh, to note. Uh, first, the website goes live at 6 p.m., uh, maritimeawarenessproject.org. Um, so please uh, uh, launch your browsers as soon as uh, we're finished uh, here today. Uh, secondly, please uh, start using MAP in your own uh, research and analysis. Uh, we didn't create this just because we thought it was interesting and we would enjoy uh, working with it, but because we want uh, the broader uh, community to be working with it. 
Uh, thirdly, uh, please uh, send us your comments and suggestions if you think there's material that we could add that would be useful. So there is a contact us uh, portion up out there on the website and we're certainly open uh, to suggestions for how to improve the product, how to make it better, how to make it more useful. Uh, we envision this as being a sort of a living uh, website um, in, in that regard and so your feedback will be excellent. Uh, Fourthly, uh, please join me in thanking everyone who actually really did make this possible uh, from Sasakawa USA and uh, from MBR. Uh, Liang, uh, Shadon Liang, um, Jeffrey Hornung, uh, Tiffany Ma, and uh, Carl, Carlos Kernikis. <laughs> uh, anyway, please join me in thanking them.